bubble baths, Merlot, Starbucks, ice cream, Netflix, sex with our husbands. This sent us into a fit of giggles. Other passengers on the plane were smiling. The sight of two attractive women, obviously very happy, evoked a positive reaction. I was a doctor, a surgeon, and Solange worked as an emergency room nurse when she was home. When we were in some shitty African country, she and I did whatever was needed at that moment. We delivered babies, set bones. We even assisted the local dentist if he needed someone. This was my second and her third experience working with Doctors Without Borders. The first time was very difficult for me, physically and psychologically. I have lost 44 pounds, which I couldn't get rid of before, and almost went crazy from depression. I literally counted down the seconds until I got home, fell into my husband's arms and cried hysterically for 10 minutes. Then I gathered my strength and grabbed my then seven-year-old son, hugging and kissing him until he almost fought me to let him go. I soon discovered that in the first few days after my return, my husband was a little cold towards me. He seemed to harbor a grudge that I left in the first place. I still remember our not entirely correct arguments about this. Let someone else save the world, honey. You have people who need you more here at home. People are dying. People I can save. You save a lot of lives right here at home, and you can sleep in our own bed without fear of being raped or killed. It's not that bad. There, I can save many more people than here. We are protected, and I am sure that I am in a safe place. Maybe I should raise the statistics for you? Sometimes I hated his work. He was a freelance writer and took assignments on any topic from anyone who was willing to pay him. He was meticulous in his research, and if he cited something, it could be quickly verified. He started small, doing it part-time, mostly as a hobby, but now he was writing for major newspapers and magazines. He even received several awards for his outstanding achievements. Then one of his friends started his own YouTube channel, where he read short essays about everything that interested him. Three years later, he had almost two million subscribers, and his annual income from advertisers was almost 100,000 a year after payment. In general, he earned as much per year, and sometimes more, than I did. Shortly before I left, he was invited to become a correspondent for CNN, mainly writing articles to dispel the excessive seriousness of the channel. Our niece told him that he was now an influential man, but he had no idea what she was talking about. She gave him the definition, and he naturally studied it. He then made an article on his channel warning people to make sure what they are being told is true, no matter how successful the person sharing the information is. We all have our own interests, even if we don't realize it. That is why I try to be impartial in my work. Just because I believe in something doesn't mean you should believe it. This doesn't mean I'm right or wrong. This means that you take everything with a grain of salt. Don't blindly accept anything I or anyone else says and use your own judgment. In other words, think for yourself. Unfortunately, in recent years, this habit has been weakening. Five months passed before he agreed that I would go. Then another three months passed before I left. I was on an emotional high, but he was still cold. I'll be home before you know it. The incredible sadness in his eyes does not leave me today. Do you understand that nothing will ever be the same? I will no longer trust you to put your family first. I'm telling you this now, not asking you. This is the only time. If you run away from your family again, you won't have it when you return. I had not yet recovered from his words when he snatched the crying child from my arms and walked away without looking back. I was sent to an African country that was about as backward as you could get outside of the urban areas. My operating room was a tent, a tent that was not very securely pitched. During the summer months, the winds blew constantly, and it was no big deal when, in the midst of an operation, the corner of the tent flew up, covering everything with dust. Surprisingly, they all did not die from infections. However, we saved many people. During my work, I attended four births one of them to a mother who had just reached puberty. The pregnancy resulted from rape. She lived in an insecure area, and her village was captured by rebels. All the women in the village were raped, many several times. She managed to escape when the man who attacked her lost consciousness. 
She stuck a knife in his throat, took everything valuable from him, including a rifle and a pistol, and ran away. They pursued her for six days until they reached their limit. While fleeing, she managed to shoot two, and as soon as she was able to move, she left the child, took the rifle, and disappeared. Rumors began to circulate about an avenging angel, then about a group of angels. The rebels left the area. Three months later, I was already climbing walls. Fear and anxiety did not go away. I first moved in with Solange, and one day I asked her why she was so calm while I was broken. I can tell you the cure. You need good sex. One of those that breaks the bed. This would probably work with single women like you. I'm married. She grinned and showed some photos on her phone. In the frame, there were a couple of little girls and a very handsome man. My husband and children. But you sleep with Jean-Luc? Yes. And if he is not available, I share the bed with Eric. Look at everyone's hand, darling. Rings are not allowed here. Symbolic, right? No one is married here. And what happens in the country stays in the country. We return to our husbands and wives and devote ourselves to them until we return again. I make sure to give my rings to my husband when I go away. And the first thing he does when I get home is put them on me. This is a comeback. And no one gets caught. One of the doctors got caught a couple of years ago. We are healthcare workers and she forgot her birth control. There was a condom shortage at the time and she tried different methods. But when she returned home, she was two months pregnant. Her husband was good at math, and the truth came out. They divorced, and the organization paid him not to make it public. The doctor was no longer allowed to serve. What about diseases? She rolled her eyes. Medical workers, remember? We get tested at least once a month, and if something pops up, we deal with it quickly. Think about it, honey. Nobody will ever know. I lasted five months, and then I lost a mother and her child to an improvised explosive device. A woman died in my arms, begging me to save her child. The child, by that time, had been gone for ten minutes. I was out of my mind and ended up drinking almost the entire bottle of bourbon, waking up in an unfamiliar bed with one of the male nurses. Before I could say anything, he was on top of me again, and I just gave in and let the release wash over me. Rodrigo did not leave my bedside until his rotation was completed, and four days later, he was replaced by a doctor. He lasted until the end of our tour. I knew my husband would know this the first time he laid eyes on me, but he was too busy still dealing with his anger over my leaving to notice. It took four months to get back into his bed, and I have to admit that many times when my husband and I had sex, I thought about Rodrigo or Michelle. A year has passed, and we are back to normal. Then the organization called me and asked me to urgently replace an employee for three months. I filled in for a woman who was in a car accident. I never told my husband that it was because a mortar shell hit him too close. We had a terrible fight and it lasted three days. Finally, he raised his hands up. Do whatever comes into your head. Just don't expect us to be waiting for you when you get home. I'll try to be polite if you want. I intend to ask for custody it will be difficult for you to get it if you go away for months or a year. No judge in his right mind would allow Tommy to live with you. Well, I never expected this. It's only been 13 weeks, and I'll be right back. I tried to reason with him. He stayed in the house for Tommy, but he barely spoke to me until I left. I didn't expect him to do it, but he took me to the airport. I didn't do this for you. I did it for myself. The fact that you're leaving knowing what you're going to lose is what I need to see to keep me going over the next few months. Everything will be completely different when you return. There's no need to rush. If they need you for a month, a year, or the rest of their lives, that's just great. He turned around without another word and left me standing there. I knew he was serious. I knew that if I wanted my family, I had to go after him. I decided to fix this as soon as I got home and turned to the ticket line. Solange greeted me with a hug when I got there. If possible, it was even more terrible than the previous place. I'm glad you're here. Don't bother unpacking. Get ready. We really need you. Forty miles from the village, there was a mortar attack, and I was amazed at the number of people who survived long enough to get to the clinic. My team worked eleven hours without a break. 
About half of our patients survived, which was pretty good, all things considered. Five died on my table. After the fourth, I simply turned to the new table and started working. One of my losses was a nine-year-old girl. Her heart stopped as she cried for her mother. I was in a daze. Solange led me into the communal shower and helped me clean up. Modesty was burned out of you quite quickly. There was little time, so the shower was shared. After three or four times, spying on sex in the shower stopped being shocking. You just crossed to the other side and tried to ignore them. Then she would crawl onto the bed and hug me while I cried in my sleep. By the next week, I had already gotten the hang of it. We talked about our last rotation and our return. Solange beamed as she talked about having sex with her husband at the end and that. He's starting to get impatient, and I can't blame him. He let me do three tours, and I think that's it for me. How does your husband deal with this? I remember he wasn't too happy last time. He says he's going to file for divorce and seek custody, using my service here against me. I hope I can make up when I get home, but last time, it took him forever to warm up to me again. I wouldn't worry, honey. Perhaps it is his fear for your safety. He may keep you on a short leash for a while, but eventually he will forgive you and come to terms with it. But I wouldn't tempt fate. The organization appreciates everything you've done, but at the end of the day, you have to put your interests first. I hope you're right. I'm going to do my best to make it up to him when I get home, and I absolutely won't be serving another tour. It's time for someone else to save the world. Then I chuckled. So who is warming your bed now? She giggled like a schoolgirl. Gerard. He is from Algeria and is very talented as a doctor. Among his other qualities. Are you going to date him? No. It's only for a few weeks. I can handle it. Two weeks later, I was already in Gerard's arms. How did this happen? Jean-Luc returned, and Solange immediately left Gerard for her former lover. I started itching again, and then everything went one after another. We helped each other for four weeks, and I cried when we broke up. I sat on the plane and made plans. There was no way I was going back, and I needed to really get that across to Brian, let him know that this wasn't for me anymore, and from now on, I was going to be a good little wife. Solange told me to work my way back into his heart through our son. And then she laughed. Remember, you may have been itching, but he wasn't itching. He must be damn horny. Wear revealing things next to him, rub against him as much as possible, redirect his blood flow from the big head to the little head, and let things happen. He'll be back on track quickly. This turned out to be a little more difficult than I thought. When I returned home, he was not there. My mom took our baby and said he told her this was too good an opportunity to pass up and he would be gone for another 10 days. This was a blessing because it gave me a lot of time to focus on my son. If I could get him back, the rest would be easy. While I was making plans to save my family, I later learned that Brian was sitting in the corporate office of our organization and talking with the head psychiatrist. Thank you for your interest in our charity, Mr. Oliver. We could use any publicity we can get. After all, we are funded by donations. It seems like a worthy cause to provide services that are so needed where they are least wanted. I know you're underestimating this, but your organization has lost people over the years, and that should be on the mind of any volunteer who comes to you. This is true. This is why we conduct a complete mental health check before accepting them. Unfortunately, this is a noble cause, but it is not for the faint of heart. Some people experience breakdowns from stress, and in recent years, cases of post-traumatic stress disorder have become common. We offer them full support for as long as they need it. It sounds like you try to take good care of your employees. How many of them do more than one rotation? There are those, but we have set a limit of four rounds and do not encourage them. Two is the norm. Considering everything that is happening around them, how do they cope with stress during service? It's difficult, but they offer each other support to boost their spirits and ease their fears. I have something to confess to you, Dr. Parkins. 
I did some research on the divorce and relationship failure rates of people who have served two or more terms, and it is unusually high. Would you like to share your opinion? The doctor was silent for a while. Some people do not cope well with the situations in which they find themselves and seek comfort, however misplaced, where they can find it. We are committed to helping restore any broken relationship. So you consider failed marriages and broken relationships to be acceptable collateral damage? The needs of the many versus the needs of the few? Will this argument fly with the spouses of doctors, nurses, and technicians about to be left behind and wondering if they will have a marriage when they return? I don't like where you're going with this interview. Stories like this will have a negative impact on the organization. Yes, my research has shown that you like to sweep such things under the rug and keep them in the shadows. I found at least three cases where significant money changed hands to avoid attracting public attention. Do your donors realize they are funding this? The doctor stood up. I consider the interview to be over, Mr. Oliver. I encourage you to think about what you write. People lose their jobs by reporting trash like this, the man chuckled, which worried the doctor. I also discovered this when checking my information. This is one of the reasons why I like to be independent. I don't need to give in to pressure. He walked to the door and turned around. For general information, you should look up Dr. Hope Oliver. I think it has already worked for you. He turned and walked out the door. As soon as it closed, the doctor put his head in his hands. This seemed to be a personal matter for the man, and his independence meant that little pressure could be put on him. He checked out Brian Oliver, aim as Zed at the number of his followers. Then he remembered seeing it on CNN. The situation could quickly become dire. He called his assistant. Get me the file on Dr. Hope Oliver. She might still be somewhere in the country. If she's home, I need her contact information. This is the first priority, Benjamin. He looked at the phone for a second after his assistant hung up, took a breath and called the CEO. I received a phone call that surprised me. This was our corporation, and the person calling occupied a very high position in the hierarchy. Dr. Oliver, we need you to come to our headquarters as soon as possible. This is very urgent. Why? Now is not the right time to leave home. My husband left on a mission, and I am now taking care of our son. In addition, I have resumed my duties at the hospital and have surgeries scheduled. And if you haven't read my dossier, you should. I will no longer serve. It was a very pleasant experience, but it's time for me to be with my family. My husband was not very supportive of my service. Your husband is exactly the reason we are calling. He was here yesterday and said some very disturbing things. Something that can greatly harm us is in the public eye. We are trying to figure this out, and it would be in your best interests to come to us. I felt like blood was flowing out of my body. Brian looked like a bloodhound. Once he caught a scent, he would pursue it to the ends of the earth if he thought it was worth it. Doctors and nurses are natural gossips, and if one of them spills the beans about something that happened overseas, it could be very, very bad for a lot of people. The first thing I did after hanging up was call Solange and tell her what the man said. I used to brag to her about what a good journalist Brian was, and we got to watch him one night in France when we were flying out while he was on CNN. Jesus Christ, this could be a disaster. My husband doesn't know how to forgive, and he will leave me in an instant. You need to contact your husband, Hope. Beg, promise him anything, just so that he doesn't do it. Think about others. Almost all of us are married. This story will probably explode on three continents. I called Brian a dozen times, but they all went to voicemail. He didn't respond to emails or messages, and I was at a loss. I had no idea where he was or how to convey a message to him. I rearranged my schedule, citing a family emergency because that was the most important thing to me, and flew to New York. I arrived there at 9 in the morning and immediately went to their headquarters. Dr. Parkins, who interviewed me before I joined the team, met me at the front desk and took me straight to his office. After the standard pleasantries, he moved on to the question of what I came for. Your husband seems to be a rather angry man, doctor. 
I'm going to ask you some tough questions that I assure you will never be discussed outside of this building, and you have to be honest if any of us want to survive this. Are you ready? I nodded, knowing what would happen next. Did you have sex with any other employee during your assignments? If yes, then with whom? Were you careful? Did you avoid making public statements? Did you talk about anything outside the organization? I named two of my longtime lovers and two more with whom I had a revelry weekend. Dr. Parkins kept a neutral expression, and I wondered what he thought of me when I finished. Thank you for your honesty. In truth, although this happens quite often, the rates are no higher than those of medical workers in everyday life. It's just that in such situations, everything is more concentrated and intense. I've probably helped dozens of people with this problem, and my advice is always the same. Do what your conscience dictates. 95% take it to their graves, and it rarely works for those who confess. He looked thoughtful for a few seconds before continuing. However, this is not an ordinary situation. From talking to your husband, I can say with reasonable certainty that he knows you went astray both times you were abroad, and he is very angry. Angry people are not prone to prudence. On the rare occasions when something remotely similar happened, we were able to contain it. In this case, this will not happen. We can put significant pressure on CNN, but we don't have the resources on his personal site. He can express himself any way he wants, and there is nothing we can do about it. This could cause us great harm. How many spouses will be as supportive as we are after the story gets out? We need these people to exist. If you have any influence over your husband, now is the time to show it. My answer did not make him very happy. Sir, now I have no idea where my husband is or what he is doing. He refused all contact with me. Who knows what he might do? We found out about this the next day. Every newspaper in New York wrote about it and was picked up all over the world. Four dozen spouses have filed a class action lawsuit against the charity for destroying their marriages and long-term relationships over the past six years. They demanded millions in compensation. The lawsuit was international. It was filed in French, English, Italian, and Algerian courts, as well as in the United States and Canada. The charity found him to be determined and very, very angry and uncooperative. They tried to reason with him until he told them that he had recorded every meeting or telephone conversation since he began the investigation. He knew that he was subject to the laws of our state and two others, and even if he did not use them in court, he could use them on his channel. Wives and husbands of those who had recently served demanded the truth from their spouses, and most did not believe what they heard. Less reputable newspapers seized on this and made a mountain out of a mountain. Sex and scandals are good for these newspapers, and there seems to be no shortage of material. On social networks, we were dubbed Doctors Without Morals. The media picked it up and made it an official mantra. They introduced Brian as the person who told the story, and it led directly to me. I was bombarded by every media outlet in the world asking for an interview but I stubbornly refused until it occurred to me that since Brian didn't want to talk to me, this might be a way to get the information to him. But I never got the chance. He eventually returned home, completely ignoring me and spending a lot of time with our son. When I told him I needed a way to contact him in emergencies, he showed me the phone and gave me the number. If you ever call for anything other than my son, I will throw him away. The first time he came to my mother to pick up Tommy, I was waiting for him on the steps. Brian, we need to talk. You have to let me explain everything and help you understand. What I did there is completely unrelated to us. It never intruded into our lives and meant nothing when I was at home. He looked at me for a second. Let me ask you something. While you were having fun having sex, did you think about how your actions would affect our marriage? Would you forgive me if you came home and discovered that I had a series of affairs while you were away? And I said they didn't mean anything because you weren't here. This is not the same thing. Nonsense. The conversation is over. Bring Tommy out so I can leave. This conversation makes me sick. After that, he stopped talking to me. When I tried to start a dialogue, he just looked at me until our son came out. Tommy was living with his father again. The court decided to leave him there as it was what he was used to and where he was most comfortable. 
The judge also ruled that Brian could live in our home until the case was resolved because he was the primary caregiver. I rented a small apartment next to the hospital. It was an ordinary box, nothing like the house with a big yard that we bought five years ago. Brian didn't have to work as many hours as I did, so he became a semi-house husband. He worked while Tommy was napping, and later while he was at school. He re-landscaped the backyard, installed a fence around it when he was finished, a sandbox, a swing set, and a very large above-ground pool where they spent hours in the summer. I think I've probably gotten into it a couple of times in the last five years. One day I came home to find three teenage girls in bikinis frolicking in our pool. I was very angry, but Brian chuckled. You know, I still need to work. I could work at night and you would take care of him, but do you really want to come home to the needs of a six-year-old after a day of work? It will be better this way. Kimberly, the one in the red bikini, is highly qualified as a nanny, so I hired her. The other two are just friends. Part of the employment agreement was the use of the pool a couple of days a week. Two friends can be with her at the same time, no more and no boys. Tommy loves her. She gets along very well with him, and I work. While working, she is never in the pool, except with Tommy. She teaches him to swim. Isn't that great? I saw the validity of his words, but they still irritated me. And you can work with half-naked, no, almost naked little Lolitas right in front of you? Lolitas? What have you been reading lately? My office is in another corner of the house. I could see them, I suppose, if I stood up from the table and strained my neck at the window. Or I can come out here like this to tell them it's getting late and they should go home. Tommy woke up from his nap and ran into my arms, then dragged me over to the girls so I could meet Miss Kimmy. Talking to them made me feel relaxed, and when Kim told me she was going to be entering a nursing program in the fall, we hit it off. I got her a job as a hospital volunteer, mentored her as best I could, and wrote her a glowing letter of recommendation for college. Kim was in her second year and doing well. She was replaced by her younger sister Alexis, Miss Lexi, whom Tommy loved almost as much as Kim. I had the feeling that they did a lot of parenting while I was away, and Miss Lexi could really, really fill out a bikini. The charity wanted to settle the class action if the agreement included a non-disclosure clause. They told me about this meeting. Brian laughed, which caused heartburn among their lawyers. Everyone else agreed. Why can't you forget about it and move on with your life? Asked one of the lawyers. I live on, Brian answered, but I have not forgiven her or your organization. I know how hard you recruited her, telling her how good this would look on her record and could lead to consulting opportunities down the line. I'm still digging to understand how you work. In every other case, the offended were bought off, sometimes with money, sometimes with business dealings. I don't need money and there's no way I'm going to bed with you idiots. I'm currently writing a second article about your organization and I'm running out of time, so fuck off. They stood up to leave and just before they walked out the door, the youngest lawyer, a woman three years out of law school, asked him a question. Isn't your anger a little undirected? In the end, it's all because of your wife. She cheated on you. I understand everything and I'm sorry, but isn't it her life, not ours, that you should turn into hell? He smiled at her, which made her nervous. He then showed her a photograph of his son. This is my son. It was thanks to him that I didn't burn out my wife. Without him, she would have been a corpse the moment she stepped off the last plane. Perhaps my anger is misdirected, but over the years, your organization should have realized that these things happen. Heck, you even wrote protocols on how to deal with an angry spouse. You've assessed the impact this will have on your organization and decided that a little collateral damage is acceptable. Apparently it was like that until I showed up. I must be your organization's worst nightmare. I have an independent income so you can't pressure me about my job. I make good money so you can't starve me. And I have enough rage to ignore veiled threats. You can go. She was a little pale when she left. The raw anger coming in waves from the man was enough to confuse her. I wasn't surprised when I received the divorce papers. Every step I took ended in disappointment. 
I came to his house so often that he filed a restraining order. If I came within a hundred feet of him or the house, I could be arrested. My employers were unhappy with the circus my life had become. In my home country, I didn't do anything wrong, and so far everything that was brought forward amounted to accusations. But the administrator still called me into his office. I am speaking to you on behalf of the board of directors. Your personal life becomes a distraction, and we cannot allow it to disrupt the normal daily routine. You are a brilliant surgeon, and we respect you very much. This is not an official statement, but simply a friendly request to you that you ask your husband to tone down a little. Please. I promised that I would do my best, knowing that, at the moment, I couldn't even talk to him. He told me I could send emails if absolutely necessary. So that evening, I sat in front of my laptop and wrote for five hours before I decided I had it all figured out. I clicked the send button and went to bed, hoping for a response. When I read the answer the next morning, I shuddered. I could care less about your professional reputation, your relationship with the hospital, or any collateral damage I cause unless it involves our son. If you catch me in a lie, send me a message and I will retract my words and give my sincere apologies. Four nurses, five technicians, and two more doctors from your hospital were on business trips for the organization. I wonder what I'll find if I follow them. I should probably warn them. Well, it didn't work. I showed the administrator the letter. He just sighed. He closed the door and exploded. Crap! Damn it! This is really bad. You know I'm going to have to gather all these people and warn them. They might not take it very well, and you'll have to work with them, so things might get a little tense. The hospital cannot, under any circumstances, reduce the quality of care for our patients, so I want you to call it a day and then clear your schedule. Take a week off to try and solve this problem. Good luck. Well, that was pretty clear. Fix this mess or start looking for a new hospital. The boss conducted interviews and I received some pretty interesting calls. Three technicians, two nurses and a doctor were in a relationship while on a business trip. The two slept with each other and took this intimacy home. All of them were married or in serious relationships. Now six people were agonizing over the decision. Should they come clean now and hope for the best or control themselves and deny everything? I hoped that they would all remain silent because if one breaks down and confesses, it could spread to everyone. This was all the news I learned later. At the moment, I was busy with work. I asked my lawyer to invite him to a conference. And if they agreed, I would sign the divorce papers. I finally realized that my marriage is ruined and nothing can fix it if only one of the spouses is ready to try. I was surprised that they agreed. Three days before our meeting, Brian published a scathing essay about doctors and the God complex. As usual, he did extensive research, talked to many experts, so he was precise and accurate. One famous psychologist said that to one degree or another, it exists in almost all successful people, regardless of their field of activity, if they have risen high enough, but in the medical profession, it is more pronounced because it is often a matter of life or death. He talked about the feeling of superiority that it sometimes creates, and it got me thinking. I learned a lot about my behavior in this essay. Have I really become that arrogant? Did I think that my calling and position allowed me to believe that the usual rules did not apply to me? Have I isolated my life to the point where I justify my behavior? The short answer is yes, yes, and yes. I was depressed when I was on these missions, but I could be faithful if I wanted to, or I could just stay home. Instead, I reasoned that what I was doing was just stress relief and wouldn't affect my marriage, that I deserved it if it kept me sane, and that what happened in the field stayed in the field. I thought about it a lot and realized that I miss casual sex, the thrill of a new partner, and I would probably cheat again here at home if I felt safe and had the opportunity. It was a sobering assessment. The meeting went surprisingly well. There were a few minor issues that needed to be resolved, but they were resolved quickly. Brian will have primary care for our son, which has already been the case since his birth, but I will have free visitation rights. Our incomes were pretty close, so there would be no alimony on either side. 
and instead of alimony, I would provide for the college fund by regularly depositing money into an account that Brian would open. In general, everything was very fair. Brian wanted to take the house, but instead of selling him my half, I signed a contract telling him to put what he would have paid me into a college fund. He thought it was very kind of me. I felt regret when I looked at him. We had a good time together. Sure, we had arguments and outright bickering, but we never held grudges and worked through our problems, and we never, ever fought in front of our child. Until I decided to go on these business trips. My therapist, yes, I had a therapist who was trying to make sure I never made the same mistakes if I found another partner and it seemed like a good idea, made me admit that this was the beginning of the point where I was no longer part of a couple and became the kingdom of one. Brian wasn't completely blameless. He could be distant and sullen, especially if he was working on something that upset him, but he did his best to keep it to a minimum. Before I went on that first mission, he was very supportive of my career, but after I returned home, it seemed like he didn't care anymore. Did I have a scheduling conflict? Not his problem. I think it was during this period that he felt that everything would not end very well and already went into self-defense mode. After all the business was settled, the lawyers left and we sat in the conference room and talked, really talked, as usual, before my first mission. It occurred to me that we hadn't had a conversation like this since I first left. This will be our last time apologizing to you, Brian. If I knew then what I know now, I would never have gotten on that plane. But at that time, I became so narcissistic, so self-confident, that now I understand that I began to make decisions with little or no concern for you and our son. Unfortunately, now any decision I make will be made without your participation. Not necessary. We still have a son, and he will keep us together for at least the next 15 years until college. Then we'll have a wedding to plan and fights over who gets grandchildren when. So we'll be a constant presence in each other's lives. It made me smile through my tears, but it was too hard. So I kissed him one last time and left. I don't know if the divorce or our conversation calmed him down, but he retreated from the organization. I know money changed hands after the class action lawsuit and Tommy's college fund increased significantly. The pressure became too much and I changed hospitals, going across town to our biggest competitor. Management did everything right, but I know they were relieved that I left. All the people on previous deployments had problems with their marriages, but fortunately there was only one divorce, although some of their remaining relationships are on fragile ground. I haven't gone on a date for almost a year, even when I started dating, I was very cautious and didn't get into a serious relationship for another year. Everything collapsed when I found out that my partner did not want children and could not be around them. Another 18 months passed and I found my love. He was also a doctor, a pediatrician, and he loved children. We took our time, both were bred, and they were still fresh enough to make us tread carefully. In a way, it was good because we really got to know each other before getting into a serious relationship. Brian also remained single, although he was dating a producer through his work at CNN, and it looked like a serious relationship. Tommy liked her, and she had two adorable little girls who followed him around like puppies when they were around each other. The television company put pressure on him to devote himself entirely to them. He didn't like the idea, and I knew that if they didn't back down, he would leave the network when his contract ended in four months. MSNBC and Fox have already sent offers, so he won't be on the air for long. One afternoon, I was driving through the area and decided to stop by to see if Tommy wanted to go to the ice cream parlor with me. It was a private little shop and they made all their ice cream themselves. There were not 50 flavors, but about a dozen, and they changed them depending on the season using local fruit when they could get it. It was peach season, and this was my favorite. They sold it by the court, and when I knew I was going to be there, I would take a little ice chest with me and buy three or four of them for the house. I almost didn't stop when I saw the car in the driveway, but I was already honking and Tommy saw me. He jumped off the porch, grinning, and his two shadows followed him. Brian and Alicia sat in the swing and waved their arms. I leaned over and hugged him. Then, the tiny four-year-old reached out her arms to me. I could have retreated, but I grinned and grabbed her and her six-year-old sister at the same time and hugged them. 
When I did this, the baby remained in my arms, and I carried her with me. A smirk appeared on Brian's face, and her mother didn't know what to say. Hello, I'm Sarah. Let's make a deal. I'll trade you a ten-year-old boy, slightly used for these cuties. Perhaps I can even be persuaded to buy a pony. The woman grinned in response. Pony? You say? Let me think about it. Martha? But everyone calls me Marty. Sarah? I can't say what they call me in mixed company, but it rhymes with witch. Then Sarah. I turned and hugged Tommy. It's time for me to go, honey. I was just passing by and thought about going out for ice cream. But I see you're busy. We'll do this another time. I forgot that I had a four-year-old child in my arms, and she started pulling my hair. I want ice cream. To do this, you will have to talk to your mother. I tried to lower her to the ground, but she did not give in. I want ice cream. Looks like I'm stuck, Marty. Would you like to go get some ice cream? It's right down the street, and they have the best homemade food you can taste. It's peach season right now, and it's my favorite. Am I giving you a treat? She chuckled and stood up, giving Brian a small peck on the cheek. I'll be back in about 45 minutes. Why don't you get everything ready for the grill? We decided to walk. The image of Brian with his mouth open made me grin as we walked towards the store. Taylor refused to go, and I forgot how hard it is to carry a small child in your arms. We told them to behave or they would get nothing, and they complied. Taylor changed her mind three times before settling on Blueberry. Alice looked at the choice with a seriousness that would put other six-year-olds to shame and decided on a banana. I took the peach one, and Marty, after the restaurant worker gave her a taste, also took the peach one. Tommy knew all the flavors and chose vanilla. The girls tried what the others had and decided that the peach was very tasty, and next time they would take it. They remained surprisingly neat and clean under the circumstances, and they were a happy group of children heading back. Marty took Taylor, although she was fussing, so Alice clung to my hand. We arrived and I told them it was time for me to go. I received little sticky kisses and big hugs from my son and walked away smiling. Marty would be good for Brian, and he always wanted more children. It looked like he was changing his place of residence. Marty called me out of the blue and asked me to have lunch. I had to think for a minute, knowing she wanted to talk about Brian. Then I made a decision. Can you come to the hospital around noon? We'll have to use the cafeteria, but they have surprisingly good food. It will be wonderful. Is midday okay? See you here. Marty was much smaller than me, but she had the confident demeanor of someone who had achieved success in her field. We made our selections and sat down, making small talk as we ate. Pushing her tray aside, she grinned. Brian and I are going to get married. I wanted to be the first to tell you about it. I don't mean to gloat. Your past is your past and has nothing to do with me, but you, through Tommy, are still a big part of his life. I just thought it would be better if we met face to face. If you don't mind, would you mind telling me what went wrong in your marriage? I know Brian can be a little narcissistic sometimes when he's on deadline or chasing something important, but he's still the sweetest person I've ever met. Now, enjoying years of therapy, I was able to be honest. Basically, in my mind, I became a little more important than Brian. Oh, I knew he was great at what he did, but I was a doctor. People lived or died by my skills and I became a little overconfident. Besides, Brian was always a homebody and I liked to go out and get all the attention when people admired my looks or my skills. I started making unilateral decisions, thinking that I was much better than him at making family decisions. In the end, these were not family decisions but what Sarah wanted decisions. I made a lot of bad decisions. Dr. International was just the straw that broke the camel's back, but even when he told me that he would divorce me if I left again, I was confident that I could get him back before that happened. You know how it turned out. Would I have changed anything at the time if I had known what I know now? Perhaps, but it would be short-lived. I ended up leaving, knowing the consequences, having sex with two partners while I was away from home, and then expecting everything to be fine when I got home. It was a shock and an eye-opener when this turned out not to be the case. I know that this, 
to a large extent destroyed my view of myself as a person rising above the limitations of society. In the end, I had to change jobs, I lost my son and my husband, and nothing I did was worth the price I paid. She sat for a minute, absorbing what I told her, then sighed. I have a little experience in your situation, not for me personally, but I have worked with many famous talking heads, and I have experienced firsthand their arrogance. One insisted that I do him a favor right before the broadcast. We were in his office and he pulled down his pants. Nothing helps me look relaxed on screen like enjoying myself below the belt, he said. I grinned, and when I picked it up, I pulled it with all my might. He screamed like a little girl. I pulled him to my knees and leaned towards him, whispering, if you try this again with me or any other woman here, I will come back and finish the job. Nod if you understand. He nodded weakly, and just as he thought I was going to let go, I yanked down and then punched him in the face as hard as I could. My handprint remained on his face for four hours. They had to urgently look for a host for the show. Upper management threatened me, but I recorded the conversation and short footage of the incident and told them that if this had any negative impact on my career, I would sell the story to their biggest competitor. After six months, they decided not to renew his contract. She looked down at her manicure and then looked up and grinned. As you can see, I know very well what a God complex is. Moreover, I know how to avoid people who have it and how to deal with those with whom I come into contact. I'm glad that you realize the mistake of your behavior and I'm sorry that you got divorced, but I'm glad that as a result, I got the man of my dreams. Does it make sense? This is true. I told my new man about this conversation that evening while we were cooking dinner together. It was kind of our thing. If one of us arrived much earlier than the other, we would do it alone, but we didn't really like it. We used this time to relax, talk about our day, and let the stress of our professional lives dissipate. This left time for important things like snuggling while watching movies, snuggling while listening to music, and when it came to messing around, just snuggling. My relationship with my pediatrician ended disastrously after I found out that he loved children too much. This happened when my laptop broke and I used his laptop to send an important email about a proposed surgery. I saw a folder labeled Sarah and opened it thinking it would contain explicit photos of me. There were many photographs, but in most of them, I was naked. Sometimes I slept, but mostly there were pictures of us making love. He had cameras, three, I later learned, to achieve the perfect combination for his collection, recording our most intimate moments. There were also many pictures of me in the shower and even in the toilet. I was really disgusted, so I searched some more, and came across a file labeled Candyland. I took the laptop straight to the nearest police station. I asked two detectives, one male and one female, to look at the file. They watched for about 30 seconds, then closed it and pulled the district attorney away from his dinner. He listened, then gave instructions. I had to take the laptop to our house while they got the warrant. Then I had to call and tell them what I had found out so that an investigation could begin. I called them on the way back. When I returned, he was already pacing the floor. He saw his laptop in my hands, instantly realized that I had seen everything and punched me in the nose with such force that it broke and I lost consciousness. As I was falling, I heard the doorbell ring. He ran out the back door, laptop in hand, straight towards two police officers. Two huge policemen, both married and with children. They appeared to believe he was resisting arrest and subdued him, resulting in several deep bruises and stun gun burns. When the trial ended, he received 15 years. They found a fragment where he seduced one of his patients. Her parents sued him for everything he had, and he went to prison, broke. People like him traditionally fare poorly in prison, and he was no exception to the rule. I had to go back to my therapist, and she helped me realize that I couldn't have known about it. He never talked about being attracted to children, other than to say that he would someday like to be the father of a couple. When he said that, it gave me hope, but now I look back and feel sad. He was quite successful, Sarah, and hid it for years. 
Everyone was shocked when the story came out. Think of how many children you may have saved and consider it fate or God to take your hand and direct you to this computer. And remember, dear, there are many good men in the world. One day, one of them will find you. I'm sure about it. I had a good man, I thought, and I ruined everything. Maybe I'm destined to be single as atonement for my misdeeds. Nine months later, I met Jeremiah. He was tall, broad shoulder red, with a killer smile and the most tender ease I had ever looked into. He had gray at his temples and beard, but the musclies visible under his shirt belied the color of his hair. I was at the convention, sent by my hospital to network and recruit. My past was a thing of the past. I had done an outstanding job for my new hospital, and they were promoting me as one of their faces in the community. There is a standard process for a graduate to apply based on a number of criteria, but at the outset the rules were not yet set in stone, and we were looking for fresh faces. At 35, I was the youngest surgeon on the staff, and it was time for some new blood. The symposium covered a wide range of topics related to medicine, and I saw Jeremiah. I was a little surprised. He owned a medical insurance company, was a certified public accountant, and a certified nurse practitioner. He had five degrees in various disciplines and an IQ that was off the charts. His seminar on unfair practices scared us all to death until he told us about steps to prevent lawsuits. He was witty, concise, quick to joke when the topic got too dark, but it was his final words that made us all pay attention. Sometimes mistakes happen. When they happen, acknowledge them. If you try to suck it up and just deal with the consequences, but it turns out later that you were actually at fault, it will be much worse in the public eye and the jury will be very unsympathetic. In addition, public opinion will brand all doctors as incompetent slackers who are only in it for the money. Currently, there is active discussion about limiting malpractice payments, and some states are considering this issue based on a rather complex algorithm that I helped develop. Until this law is passed, remember that the higher the meanness factor, the greater the compensation. I will be available for individual questions until the end of the conference. Thank you. There has been a lot of positive feedback, and it seems like three doctors have gathered around him. I gave up trying to talk to him and hurried to my next seminar. I didn't see him until late in the evening when I ran into what I thought was an empty conference room, trying to dodge another doctor who had drunk a magic drink, the one that makes all men think that they are a gift to all women and that they should worship them accordingly. You had to either hide or slap him, and that wasn't very good. I nearly jumped out of my skin when his voice came out of the darkness. Let me guess, hiding from your demons? I recognized him and smiled. I'm afraid only of one. And you? I needed a break. With the amount of time doctors devote to training, some of them can be extremely ignorant of how the real world works. You don't need to repeat it. As a doctor, I can say that I have made many stupid decisions in my life, but I am proud to say that none of those decisions involved a patient. Well, then that puts you first. We spent the next 15 minutes having a pleasant conversation. Then the door swung open and he appeared. Dr. Miracle Dick. Where are you? And what are you doing? Well, I was going to have hot sex with this guy, but you barged in and ruined everything. Go away, I've almost reached the most interesting part. He swayed slightly as his alcohol-soaked brain tried to comprehend what I had said. He was about to leave when Jeremiah stood up, towering over him. Leave if you don't want to look. He opened and closed his mouth several times before muttering damn and staggering out. We looked at each other before breaking into laughter. When we stopped, we started talking, just pleasant conversation about safe topics. I kissed him on the cheek when we parted and he hugged me very sweetly. The next morning, I saw him at breakfast, and he stood up, inviting me to join him. I went to my seminars, and he held his after we agreed to have lunch. Lunch was pleasant. He took me to a restaurant away from the conference where we could relax, then to a small club where the music wasn't too loud, and we danced a few slow songs. I was a tall girl, but in his arms, I felt tiny. Back at the hotel, he took me to my room and kissed me very nicely. Not too strong and without a tongue, but promising. It made me want more. 
We discovered that we were from the same city and our relationship developed quickly. He was married, but she tragically died in childbirth from a disease that no one knew about. They managed to save the girl, although she spent almost two months in the hospital. She was seven years old. I told him my story about three months after we started dating and right after we became intimate. He listened without interrupting and then just hugged me while I cried, scared to death that he would want to end our relationship. My heart melted when he spoke. You can't change the past. It sounds like you've made a number of mistakes, but you've learned from them. If I didn't think I could trust you, we wouldn't be where we are now. I tried to love him to death. Luckily, it didn't work, but by the end of the weekend, he was pretty lethargic. We were still in no rush, but gradually I spent more and more time at his house. I was very nervous introducing him to my son, but they got along great. There was a very good archer, and he introduced Tommy to this activity after talking with my ex. He said nothing about their meeting, except that he seemed like a decent guy. One day I came home and it was full of children. Tommy and his younger sisters. All three. Brian and Marty had a child together, a little girl who seemed terribly smart. I raised an eyebrow and Yeri blushed slightly and then chuckled. We'll manage this herd for two days while Marty goes to New York to collect his reward. It looks like her star is on the rise now that she is the executive producer of Brian's new show. CNN got Brian to host an hour-long show three days a week, alternating with another show. Ratings were high and rising. Brian's only demand in the negotiations was that the show be hosted by his wife, and the network immediately agreed. Marty did such a good job that the show won an Emmy, and Brian couldn't help but be proud of his wife. In one of his shows, he even spoke eloquently about how much he loved her, leaving her confused. I couldn't help but watch his show, feeling a pang of regret, as I realized that if things had been different, if I had managed to remain faithful and lower my ego enough, he would have raved about me on his show. Then I looked at Yere and realized that perhaps he was the destination I was destined to arrive at. Two days turned into three when they asked for an extra day. Yere was over the moon, the big girls wanted to shoot Terry's bow, but he was a teenager, and the bow was physically too big for them. Yer solved this problem with a trip to the academy, buying them small bows and all the accessories. Taylor was a natural shooter and Alice was quite good. Lucy, Yere's daughter, was very helpful. Then Tina wanted a bow, and I came to the rescue by buying her one of those toy bows with suction cups on the end of the arrows instead of arrowheads. For a three-year-old, it was pretty good, and I regretted my decision every time I had to pull the arrow out of the TV screen patio door, or car window. Jeremiah and the kids thought it was hilarious. I was both exhausted and excited. Lucy, at first, behaved somewhat warily, not wanting to share her dad with anyone, but gradually she accepted me, and we became closer. I gave her all the love I couldn't give my son, and she thrived. The fact that girls her age were next to her for several days lifted her spirits, and when they left, Everyone hugged and kissed. We were sitting on the couch, relaxing, when Lucy crawled on top of us. After she squirmed until she was comfortable, she said something that rocked my world. Mom, can I have a little sister? It was the first time she called me mom, and tears flowed as I hugged her. When I could speak, I kissed the top of her head. It depends, baby. What does daddy think about this idea? Dad grinned, holding a small box in his hands. Dad thinks this is the best idea he's heard in a long time. I cried for 30 minutes, kissing and hugging them both the entire time. I had wanted a baby for a long time. Willpower won out, and two weeks before my 38th birthday, I gave birth to an eight-pound baby boy. The waiting room was filled to capacity. I was a beloved doctor, and the nurses were constantly fussing over me. I wasn't surprised to see Brian, Marty, and their brood. I was surprised to see his mother. She went out of state for a while, and I didn't know she was back. I couldn't hold back my tears when she asked me to hold her new granddaughter. Soon, he and Jeremiah's mother were already sitting in an embrace, planning the future of all the children gathered. Lucy made sure that she was the first to hold her brother in her arms after her parents. 
She was a little disappointed that he was a boy, but as soon as she looked at his face, she immediately accepted it. When he was five and she was 13, if he was naughty, she would take him in her arms and shower him with kisses. Soon he was giggling and trying to wipe them off as quickly as she planted them. One of the largest photographs on her nightstand is the one in which she holds her brother for the first time. I was 53. I was the chief physician of the surgical department. Knowing that in a few years my arms would give out, I planned my retirement. I was a mother figure to young doctors and nurses, and they often trusted me. One of the most beautiful nurses turned to me for advice. I heard that you worked with the organization Doctors Without Borders. I was offered a job. Do you have any advice? I didn't embellish. I talked about my experience and what it cost me. She recently got married, and I asked if her husband agreed. He doesn't know yet. Then you should talk about it. Are you ready to be away from him for so long? Will he be willing to wait for you to come home? The organization has done a great job, but there is always a cost and a downside. You must weigh your decision carefully before making it. In the end, she didn't go, but one person went instead. Before leaving, she broke up with her boyfriend, and by the time she returned, he was engaged, which dashed all her hopes of reconciliation. We thought she did it on purpose in case she decided to have a couple of flings while she was away, and never once did we think he would replace her so quickly. She was pretty depressed for about four months, and when she was offered another assignment, she turned it down. Tommy graduated with a master's degree in journalism and got a job as a production assistant at Fox. Lucy was a junior in the pre-medication program. Alice is in the same program and they live in the same room. Taylor is a senior and has a full scholarship to play volleyball. Tina is a freshman in high school and seems to specialize in boys. At 14 years old, she looks 20 and men and boys just go crazy over her. She has a good head on her shoulders and if they push hard, she shows them pictures of her, her sisters, brother, cousins Lucy and JJ, with ribbons and trophies for archery and karate. Tommy was an alternate on the Olympic team last year, and JJ, at 15, was already a second Dan black belt. Lucy, two years ago, became the state champion in archery in her age group, narrowly beating out her cousin Taylor. One day I met Brian in a cafe and we sat down at a table. I apologized again for my behavior, but he waved me off. It's in the past. Let's leave it there. Instead, we complained about our children and spouses for half an hour, kissed and went our separate ways. I thought about this as I watched him walk away along the sidewalk. I remembered the old adage that cheaters never prosper, and I realized that it was not true, at least in my case. Yes, I did a terrible thing, wallowing in self-righteousness and arrogance, and I really suffered for quite a long time. But in the end, I think the pain I went through helped me become a better person. I'd like to think it affected my marriage and relationships with all the people I cared about. I used this experience when I counseled the young people I worked with, hoping that my story would make a difference. I grinned, feeling for the envelope in my pocket. My gift to my husband for his upcoming wedding anniversary is two weeks at one of the most exclusive resorts in Thailand. Sun, sand, clothing optional. I didn't have the toned body I had when I was 30, but I played sports and was voted one of the top three old ladies in my hospital. Jeremiah still looked at me like I was a hot young thing, and I wanted it to never go away. So I endured the pain and tried to ignore the ravages of time and nature until some of these destruction, conscience, would have to be attributed to him. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one.